The title of my message today is, It is Happening Now. And you may ask, what is happening now? The life on which you will be judged is happening right now. Each day you live, a page in your life is written, and that is something you need to remember. The life against which God will judge you is happening right now. Your life is not a game. You do not get two lives or another opportunity. You only have one life, and it is happening right now, right before your eyes. God is not going to judge your life based on anyone else's life but your own. It is happening right now. Today, I want to talk about a day when all of the unbelieving mankind will be brought before the judge of mankind, where the old and young will be there, the rich and the poor. It makes no difference who you are, where you were born, and when you were born. All unbelievers will be brought before that great white throne judgment to be judged for their sins. This time is where the earth and the heaven fled away. At face value, the imagery suggests a dissolving or vanishing of the known universe. The heavens and the earth, as the totality of creation, are seen to flee from the presence of God, who is seated on the great white throne. This is not merely a physical transformation, but a profound reordering of reality itself. Peter 3.12 Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Revelation 20.11 And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Both 2 Peter 3.12 and Revelation 20.11 deal with eschatological themes, that is, events related to the end times and final judgment according to Christian theology, but they describe these events in different contexts and imagery. 2 Peter 3.12 refers to the day of God and describes how believers should live in anticipation of this day. It mentions that the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Both passages ultimately speak to the belief that the current order of things, the cosmos as we know it, will undergo a profound transformation at the end of time. They both depict a form of destruction or passing away of the current heavens and earth, making way for a new, recreated order that is free from sin and death. Today we are going to focus on Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, and whosoever was not found, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire, Think about how long the great white judgment will be. I pray that every person listening to me right now will already have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat, is described primarily in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and Romans 14.10. This judgment is for believers in Jesus Christ, those who have put their faith in Him for salvation. I pray that each and every one of you will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and will only witness the great white throne judgment and not take part in it. When I read about the white throne, I often think about what it will be like to witness this vast sea of people who will all be judged one by one. I often think about how long judgment day will be, for when this event takes place, we will be in eternity and time will no longer be a constraint for us. Seeing that time will no longer be a constraint for human beings, and seeing as we are in eternity, 
If God chooses, he could review each person's life at its present speed, so God could theoretically speaking take 24 hours to review 24 hours. It wouldn't make any difference because we are in eternity and we have all the time we will ever need. And I wonder how people will feel, how people will feel as the books are opened and their lives are being reviewed for all eternity to see. How will they feel as they think about each time someone spoke to them about Jesus Christ and the salvation he offers? I wonder how people will feel when they think back to the missed opportunities to accept the free gift of salvation and take it seriously. I wonder how people will feel about the times they sinned, knowing it was sin, and yet they chose to sin nonetheless. I wonder, I wonder how people will feel about their secret sins while standing before this great white throne. I wonder, I honestly wonder how people will feel about their secret sins, their temper, their hate, their jealousy. And even right now, as I am preaching this message to you, the Holy Spirit is speaking, highlighting areas in your life you need to change. My friends, listen to me. The life which God will judge you on is happening right now. Not later, not at any other time, but right now. That is a sobering thought, that the life God will judge you on is happening right now. And yet, although you know this, are you going to continue with that sin? Even as I am preaching this message, there are men who have a second family on the side in another state, married men who have a mistress on the side in another state or another part of town, and no one knows about this. It is a secret sin that you keep to yourself and you have kept to yourself for some time now, for even years, and it appears as if you are getting away with it. Life is moving on but you will have to answer for your adultery on this day we are speaking of. Stop committing adultery. It is not the unforgivable sin God will forgive you. You do not need to confess your sin to the world. Confess it to God, repent and do not return to that sin. Go back home and be faithful to your wife. Even now as I am preaching, there may be a lady who has an issue of unforgiveness in her heart. Her heart is a prison. She never ever forgives, even though God's word commands her to forgive. God's word demands her to forgive. God's word requires her to forgive. And she knows this, but in her heart, she is just holding on to unforgiveness because someone wronged her, not knowing that one day God will judge her for her heart. For you see, at the great white throne judgment, when the earth and the heaven will flee away, God will review the very hearts of people. We as humans tend to identify obvious sins and point the finger of condemnation at obvious sins like drunkenness, fornication, adultery, murder, lying, stealing and so on. But we tend to turn a blind eye to sins of the spirit, which are less obvious, such as hardness of heart, pride, envy, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, greed, and jealousy. These sins can be harbored in the heart without any overt physical action, yet they are sins nonetheless, sins that are evident and obvious to the God who sees the very heart of mankind. Even now, while my words reach your ears, there's a businessman. He stands well respected, an image of success and integrity in the eyes of his community, Yet beneath this veneer, he's embezzling funds, siphoning from the pockets of those who trust him the most. A secret sin, shrouded in complex deception and false smiles. For years, he's built his life on this lie, amassing wealth that is not his to claim. It may seem as though he's prospering, untouched by the consequences, but on the day of judgment, he will be held accountable for his theft. At this very moment, consider the young woman who sits in the church pew every Sunday. Outwardly, she sings praises and bows her head in prayer, but inside, she's entwined in an affair with a married man. She knows he is married, yet she is willing in an affair with a married man. 
It's a secret dance of shadows, hidden texts, and hushed phone calls behind closed doors. To her, it feels like a love that cannot be denied. But in reality, it's a sin she hides from the world. The thrill of secrecy convinces her she's safe from judgment, but the day will come when the full weight of her actions will come to light. This is my point, my friends. The life you will be judged on is happening right now. How are you living your life? I marvel when I see people who live as though they are destined to live forever, or the world is the only place man is created to live in and nothing else afterward. Psalm 90, 10, 12. Our days may come to 70 years, or 80, if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In this verse, the psalmist is reflecting on the typical lifespan of humans. Seventy years was considered a full life at the time the psalms were written, with eighty years being possible for those with greater strength or vitality. However, even a long life is characterized by toil and trouble, and passes quickly. The verse also speaks to the fleeting nature of human existence in contrast to God's eternal presence. Life is transient, they are soon gone, and death is inevitable, and we fly away. Men and women throughout history have set themselves against death. They have tried to resist it, postpone it, delay it, and do everything in their power to cancel it, but death is inevitable. Psalm 90.12 says, So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. This verse follows the earlier themes of the psalm, which contrast the eternal nature of God with the fleeting existence of human life. Here, the psalmist requests that God helps us to understand the brevity of our lives, to number our days, so that we might live wisely. Moses here is praying a prayer that we all must pray. In simple terms, he is saying to the Lord, My time is short, each day is one less, and I shall never know when today is the last day for me. Teach me to number my days. Teach me to live each as if it is my last day, because if I live in this way, I will live in wisdom. In simple terms, a sense of the fragility of life goes hand in hand with wisdom. However, not everyone who is being judged at the Great White Judgment has lived that way. And if you look at the generation and the world we live in, people do not see the fragility of life. People do not have the perception that one day they will be judged. This is a warning for us all. And this is a prayer we must pray to God. Teach me, Lord, to number my days, that I may get a heart of wisdom. The act of numbering our days implies being mindful of the finite nature of our time on earth. It is an appeal for a perspective that acknowledges the limited time allotted to each person and thus prioritizes living in a way that is meaningful and discerning. This wisdom is not just intellectual knowledge, but also the deep insight that guides ethical living, shapes character and aligns one's life with God's will. The person who numbers his days remembers that life isn't permanent, therefore he lives as if life isn't permanent. Too many people live as if life is permanent when it is not. The person who numbers his days remembers that there is a God who is watching me, who will one day judge me. Therefore, he or she lives a life that reflects the fact that a holy God is watching them and a holy God will one day judge them. Too many live as if they won't be judged and that there is no holy God watching them. A man or woman who numbers their days does not live as if they have all the time in the world because they haven't got all the time in the world. You and I live in a world where people live as if they have all the time in the world, as if they will never have to answer to a holy God who hates sin. In asking for this kind of wisdom, the psalmist is implying that understanding the shortness of life can lead to a sense of urgency and purpose. 
encouraging people to make the most of their time by focusing on what is truly important, not the pursuit of temporary pleasures or material gains, but the pursuit of a righteous and meaningful life in relationship with God. The verse serves as a poignant reminder that life should be lived with intention and a clear understanding of one's mortal limitations. It is a call to conscious living, to personal growth and to spiritual maturity, highlighting the need for divine guidance to achieve these ends. There is only one thing that will stop you from being judged at the great white throne judgment. Only the Lamb of God, who died the death of all deaths on the cross, can save you from the great white throne judgment. Only the Lamb of God can save you from the second death. Only the Lamb of God can save you from spending eternity in the lake of fire. He is Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Eternal Son of God, the Creator of the universe, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And right now, this very day, He can take your sins away, and you will spend eternity with Him. You will rejoice with Him for endless ages. For endless ages, you can be with Him. Psalm 90, 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. You are not promised tomorrow. Now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. Think of Jesus Christ. He took a human nature upon himself and was born a child on this earth. Born an infant, a babe from the womb of the Virgin Mary. And he lived amongst us and breathed the same air you and I breathe ate the same food you and I ate, cried tears on this very earth you and I live on, and for 33 years he lived amongst us. This holy God who created us lived among us in a world that is full of sin and temptation, yet he himself never sinned and was perfect. He was actually here amongst us. And then at last, he paid the price that no man or angel could pay, he laid down his life and was crucified here, and he died for three days. He did not faint. He was not in a coma. He died for three days, but on the third day, he rose again, and he eventually ascended into heaven. He did that all so that you may have eternal life. God wants you in heaven, and God will go to extraordinary lengths to ensure you go to heaven. Can you imagine how you will feel being in heaven and seeing your first love, Jesus? You knowing all he has done for you, you knowing the horrors of hell and that he saved you from that, seeing his face and knowing that if there is one person in all of the universe who deserved hell, it was you, but you are not in hell not because of anything you have done, but because of everything Christ did for you. Just imagine seeing the face of Jesus in heaven, how touched and moved and overwhelmed you will feel. Our English language does not have the vocabulary to explain the feeling you will have, and I pray that this message will be ingrained into your heart and mind. I pray this message follows you wherever you go, to remember that my days on this earth are numbered and I should live in a way that reflects that. The final minutes before eternal life. Let us turn our hearts to a pivotal moment from the sacred narrative inscribed during the journey of the Israelites. A period marked by wandering and wilderness. This historical backdrop aligns closely with a time of great personal bereavement for Moses, the passing of his dear sister Miriam and his brother Aaron, who served as the high priest. Understand, the generation that beheld the mighty acts of God in Egypt, who crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, did not cross the Jordan into the land of promise. Rather, it was their children, born in the crucible of the wilderness, who would enter the land flowing with milk and honey, amongst the many who were once slaves in Egypt. Only Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun, were permitted by the Almighty to set foot in the Promised Land. 
Moses, the great leader and lawgiver, also faced this epoch of profound personal loss. Not only did he mourn his siblings, but he also endured the pain of seeing his generation, the very people he had led out of Egypt, pass away one by one without claiming the land promised to them. While he was given the grace to view the land from afar, the threshold of Canaan was a boundary he himself was not ordained to cross. At the close of this passage, as Moses stood on the precipice of history, gazing into a future he would not enter, he epitomized a man who had come to terms with his own mortality and the unswerving justice of God. Now allow to read you some verses from the prayer of Moses during this period. Psalm 91.5 Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. Let us go through this passage, as a man thinks about the final moments before death. Psalm 91.5 Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. This man, this prophet, this great leader Moses, as he sees his friends, colleagues and relatives die, his heart claims tremendous comfort in knowing that whoever else comes and whoever else goes, his God is always there as his home. And in that moment of consideration of death, his heart went out in prayer to God and found comfort. That is something for us to do each and every day, to remember the eternity of God, but the temporary nature of human life. Thousands of years before you and I were born, billions of people have come and billions of people have gone. And God has been a dwelling place for them he is the God of all generations, and even when you are gone from this earth, He will continue to be the God of generations. With all the thousands, and even tens of thousands, with all the hundreds of thousands of people who are watching and listening to me now, one day, soon only one of us will be left on this earth, and he or she will pass into eternity. But whoever comes and goes from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, and that God is the home of his people. This psalm is a meditation on the eternal nature of God in contrast to the frailty of human life. Psalm 93 says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. The amplified translation of this verse states, Psalm 93. You turn man back to dust and say, Return to the earth, O children of mortal men. This verse is a reminder of human mortality and the transient nature of human life in comparison to the everlasting nature of God. The phrase, Return to dust, echoes the judgment upon Adam in Genesis 3.19, after the fall. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. It speaks to the common destiny of all human beings. We come from dust, and to dust we shall return. In this way, the psalmist acknowledges the power of God over life and death, and the reality that human life is fleeting. We are dust, and to dust we will return. This one verse tells us that your life and my life are in the hands of God. At his decree and at his call, our bodies will be instructed to go back to dust. For each and every person who has ever lived and died, it is the decree of God that has removed them from this world. This is why it is important to remember that your life is not in your own hands. The parable of the rich fool is a story told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, specifically found in Luke 12:16-21. Here's a summary of the parable. 
A rich man's land produced a bountiful crop, so much so that he didn't have enough space to store his crops. He decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones to store all his grain and goods. He then told himself that he had plenty of goods laid up for many years and that he could take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. However, God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The parable concludes with the moral that this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The sudden end of the rich man's life serves as a stark reminder that despite one's plans and perceived control over their life, the duration of one's life is ultimately not in their hands. It is in God's. You can be on this earth one minute, and the next you can be in eternity. The man in the parable focused solely on his wealth and comfort, without consideration for his spiritual well-being or the needs of others. His life was demanded of him unexpectedly, underscoring the uncertainty of life and the folly of placing one's security in material wealth. The truth is young people die and old people die too. Healthy people die and unhealthy people die too. God is the one who gives life, and God is also the one who takes it away. We are fragile, fragile beings, my friends. We human beings live with this illusion that we are strong and durable, but we are not. We are fragile beings. And the older you get, the more you realize how fragile you are. One day, for some sooner than others, God will call us home and death will take us all one by one, certainly and surely. Never lose sight of the frailty of human beings or your own frailty. This theme of transience is a common one in wisdom literature and serves to remind readers of the importance of living life in light of the eternal and the limits of human control over our own destiny. The verse may also be understood as a call to humility and reverence before God recognizing our own limitations and God's sovereignty. Psalm 94 For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Moses is reflecting on the nature of time as it relates to God. This meditation forms part of a prayer that grapples with the human experience of time's swift passage in comparison to God's eternal presence. Just as Psalm 93 emphasizes human mortality, Psalm 94 continues the theme of contrasting the eternal God with mortal human beings. Moses is saying that even a thousand years, which is far beyond a human lifespan and represents an extensive duration in human history, is like a single day to God. This day has gone by, suggesting that in God's perspective, Time is not a linear progression as humans experience it. His ways are far above our ways, and his thoughts are far above our thoughts. By likening a thousand years to a watch in the night, a term that often referred to a short period of a few hours vigil during the night, Moses underscores the brevity of what humans consider long. A watch in the night is fleeting, easily gone and forgotten. This imagery highlights God's transcendence over time. God is timeless, and what we perceive as long and drawn out is but a moment to Him. Even if you have 50 more years on this earth, it is only but a moment. The time to live for God is now, today. Not tomorrow, but today. This statement puts all of human history into perspective. Empires rise and fall, generations come and go, and entire millennia pass. But for God, these are like mere moments. It underscores the insignificance of our own historical achievements when measured against the backdrop of divine eternity. The truth is, one day we will all be forgotten. No matter how great our achievements are, we will still be existing in either heaven or hell. 
Just as Psalm 93 calls for humility in the face of our mortality, Psalm 90-4 calls for humility regarding our place in time. It challenges readers to recognize the vastness of divine time and to reconsider their own significance in light of God's eternity. It suggests a relinquishing of human arrogance and anxiety over the passing of time, instead encouraging trust in the eternal God. Psalm 90-5 Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. The psalmist is likening the act of God taking lives to a flood. A flood is a powerful, overwhelming force of nature that can wash away everything in its path. Floods can take buildings away which once appeared stable, buildings that looked structurally sound, but a flood can take them away. Similarly, human life can be swept away by the power of God, which is beyond our control. It highlights the unstoppable and all-encompassing power of God over life. We as human beings are fragile, fragile beings, and we should never forget that. However, as we pass from this life to the next, we will go home to be with the Lord. The Lord has been a dwelling place in all generations. For a born-again believer, God is their home. God is their father. God is their place of security. I am his and he is mine. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I could preach 10,000 years about 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knoweth them that are his, right now all across the world, in major cities and in remote locations, the Lord knoweth them that are his in subway stations and on mountain tops, the Lord knoweth them that are His. All across the world, there are those who the Lord knows are His, and that if they were to breathe their last breath the next moment, they would be in eternity with God the Father. He knows those who belong to Him. He said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you know His voices? Do you know His Spirit? Do you know His goodness, His mercy, His loving kindness? Do you know what it is to talk with Him, talk with Him, fellowship and commune with Him? Do you know what it is to have your sins forgiven? Do you know what it is to be heading to the very gates of hell one minute and to be heading to the very gates of heaven the next minute? Do you know what it is to pass from death unto life? Do you know what it is to live with the fear of death and then to be born again and then to no longer fear death? There are so many things we do not know. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. We do not know what will even happen 10 minutes from now. We do not know how the future will unfold. We do not know the date or time at which we will pass on into eternity. But one thing that you can know for sure is the voice of the Lord. John 10.27 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And the voice of the Lord is saying to you today, You do not have to fear death. You do not have to fear tomorrow. You do not have to fear what the future holds, for I am your home. I am your dwelling, and I have been the dwelling place in all generations. This is God's word for you today. I am your home. Heaven is your home, when Moses states, Psalm 90. One Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. He is highlighting something very clear. God is the home of believers. And this is one of the many reasons we as Christians should look forward to home. What you will experience in heaven is the feeling of being home, because heaven is where your heavenly Father dwells and you will finally, finally, finally be home where your heavenly Father dwells. During your first hour in heaven, you will finally feel at home in complete and utter peace, complete safety and security. Think about what it means to feel at home. 
It means being in a place where you are comfortable, where you are surrounded by people who love and care for you, where you can be yourself and feel accepted for who you are. That is exactly what heaven is. And that is exactly what you will experience during your first hour in heaven. You will be welcomed with open arms. You will be surrounded by the love of God and your fellow believers, and you will see the whole atmosphere of heaven will be the Holy Spirit.